And uh, well, I want to start by welcoming everyone and thank you for being here today for our very first uh, event of uh, uh, IBA's latest uh, addition to the public program, IBA Stage. And uh, uh, with IBA Stage, we want to give uh, our members and the wider biennial community an opportunity to encounter projects uh, which uh, you might not have the chance to visit uh, throughout the work uh, and through the words of uh, their makers. Uh, it is an event series born out of, the out of our desire to give everyone the possibility to experience each other's projects and to stay true to our commitment of promoting biennial making worldwide. Uh, we imagine it as a space uh, shaped in a way uh, and form each biennial will feel more comfortable with. Today's event, uh, we'll have a short Q&A session for those in the audience uh, uh, for those in the audience that is moderated by the by the iba team taking place uh, after the presentation it would also be live streamed uh, through our so social media outlet and recorded to allow a wider audience to experience today's uh, featured biennial and as a reminder uh, members who are interested in presenting their projects through iba stage in the future are encouraged to contact us through the info at uh, biennialassociation.org email so for the inaugural event, uh, I am very happy to have with us uh, uh, Dr. Samantha Lackey, uh, Director of the Liverpool Biennial, and uh, Manuela Moscoso, Curator of the 11th edition, titled uh, The Stomach and the Pork, and the Port, which took place between March and June this year, with some extension until September. We will hear from them soon. And during the presentation, just a few um, uh, house rules, let's say. We ask you to keep the cameras and microphones off, uh, and you're more than welcome to turn them back on after the presentation for the Q&A session. So during the, during the presentation today, um, Sam, uh, Sam and, and Manuela will discuss the challenges of delivering the, UK, the, the um, Liverpool Biennial during COVID-19 times and the shifting of the Biennial's conceptual framework work alongside the experience of the pandemic. While the physical exhibition has officially closed, I hope today will offer an opportunity to experience selected aspects uh, of the Biennial while providing a chance to speak directly with those responsible for making it possible. And uh, I will briefly introduce you both before we start the presentation. Uh, Dr. Samantha Lackey is director of Liverpool Biennial. She was head of collection and exhibitions at the Whitworth in Manchester, where she was senior lead on the leadership team. Previously, she was curator at the Hepworth uh, Wakefield, where she delivered over 40 exhibitions over four years as part of the team that opened the gallery in 2011 to critical acclaim. She received a PhD on the subject of surrealism in 2005 which was the context uh, for her work uh, as a lecturer, research fellow, and her first exhibition at the Whitworth, Subversive Spaces, Surrealism and Contemporary Art. And Manuela Moscoso, uh, who was the curator of the last edition of the Liverpool Biennial in 2021, uh, before that was a senior curator at uh, Museo Tamayo in Mexico City. And previously she was the associate curator of the Biennale de Cuenca, uh, in, in its 12th edition in Ecuador, and the co-director of Capacete, a residency program based in Brazil, where she also ran the curatorial program Typewriter. She is the co-founder of uh, Zarigüeya, I hope I pronounced that well, uh, a program that activates relationships between contemporary art and the pre-Columbian collection of the Museo Casa uh, del de Alabado in Ecuador. So after this very brief presentation, I am extremely happy to leave you the floor and hear more about uh, um, what happened in Liverpool this year. Thank you. And thanks so much, Christian, for the invitation for us to be the first, um, not guinea pigs, but the, the first um, biennial to present within this series. We're really delighted to have this opportunity to share you know, every opportunity that we have really to share the biennial that everyone works so hard to make happen here in Liverpool. And thank you everybody who's here today as well. It's really lovely to be here in this international community. My first time really. So yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Manuela 
in a minute just to talk through the presentation because as many of you know I didn't come to the biennial until relatively late in its process um, in December of last year but I was completely honoured to be involved in the project and in developing and delivering the biennial in quite difficult times that we've all experienced over the nine venues that we had in Liverpool. And that's with our partners across the city, our institutional partners. So as some of you may know, we work with Tate, we work with the galleries Open Eye, with Blue Coat. Um, we worked with the Central Library and the National Museums, and we also had three of our own venues. Um, but that in itself had changed relatively recently um, in the process of the biennial as well. So perhaps we could talk a little bit about that. Um, and I'm glad to say that we're just sort of working on our evaluations of the biennial now. And I've come from a meeting um, with the partners in Liverpool where um, the biennial's role for reopening the city was acknowledged as really significant. This moment that we had in March, firstly to open our outdoor sculptures and installations, and then to open the whole city simultaneously and reopen the cultural organisations later was incredibly important for the city and brought in a significant um, number of visitors and people feeling safe within that city community again. And for that, um, I yeah just need to echo my thanks to all our partners here in Liverpool and to my brilliant colleague or former colleague. And it's really lovely to be with her again, quite frankly, even if it's only on Zoom, um, Manuela Moscoso, who I miss terribly. So I'm going to hand you over to her now to talk about the biennial, to introduce um, the, some of the ideas, some of the challenges, and to give you all an idea of what we did manage to achieve here um, with the help from all our partners, both in the UK and around the world. And of course, our amazing artists who were so flexible over and over again. So Manu, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for these amazing presentations. And again, thank you for this invitation. As Sam said, we are, we are very happy every time somebody invites us to tell a little bit about the experience of doing this biennial. And I, and I guess for any biennial that had to happen in this period of time, had to face significant challenges to be able to kind of realize the projects that you know, were on, you know, in the process of being made. And while at the same time keeping you know, like an integrity of the project, I think was very challenging for everybody. Um, I, I just to give you a little bit of context uh, in terms of like the timeline of the Liverpool Biennial, I was invited to, to do the Biennial in July 2018 and start working in November 2018. So let's say when the pandemic hit, the Biennial was very much formed. We were really into the execu execution, you know, like usually uh, the, the speed of how you execute gets really tight at the end. So we were exactly in the moment that we had to put our fifth gear and the project was pretty much well formed. Um, so the stomach and the port, uh, it referred a little, you know, something that I came from Latin America after living in Latin America. And uh, specifically in 2018, I started to really be interested uh, to think very much uh, in relation to what was happening in America at the time, which was a turn to the right, and where many vulnerable bodies became vulnerable, even more vulnerable because of the you know sort of political landscape that was happening in Latin America. And uh, I came to Liverpool with a desire to really think about uh, notions of the body and how what we conceive as a body has been, you know, over centuries being shaped and normalized. And it was Liverpool and in incredibly important city to think about those ideas. Um, so we had 50 artists uh, and collectives invited to do. Uh, from England, it was more or less 10 uh, of those 50 and the, the, the other artists came from different places from the world. And uh, what we did, which uh, I'll, I'll try to share, um, uh, I will try to share just because I will show you first the video. Uh, what we did is we, we 
uh, occupied nine um, occupied or we were uh, as well um, did exhibitions in nine venues, uh, which were previously 15 venues before the biennial. So the process of changing uh, pre-COVID to post-COVID was quite significant. We not only kind of shrink, but it was much more of idea of consolidation of, of the spaces because we were thinking on the difficulties to have like a track and trace on those days of like how do we track and trace everybody that goes to 15 places and the idea of consolidation it made completely sense so in a way we had or I had to redo the exhibition as a form many 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 times within the months that we had to reshape although many of the projects remained the same. Uh, for that, I, we are going to start with one video just to give you like one sense of one of the strategies that we did in order to amplify the work that was the exhibition making in sort of each venue. We are going to see one of the venues, which is the Cotton Exchange that refers to, uh, I will explain it there, so I will not repeat. And uh, we have in the website curatorial tours from each of the spaces that we try to do like as short as possible, but somehow giving a sense of what it is to make a show as you is very difficult to translate the experience of a place into a virtual um, uh, sphere. So uh, maybe we can start with one of the videos and then I can continue. If you like, I will stop sharing. And if you like, uh, Chris, can you can you share? Here we are in the Cotton Exchange building, a historical building that was built in the early 20th century. In the 19th century, Liverpool emerged as a central to the cotton trade, and by the early 20th century, it held the largest single stock of cotton in the world. This former Cotton Exchange building is symbolic of the moment in the city economy and societal history. The building is explicitly and integrally tied to a time when wealth and economy, prosperity depended upon the enforced movement of people, enslavement, trade and labor. The works gathered in this venue address the long-term impacts of the mass and forced dispersion of African people in different American contexts, Colombia, Brazil and the United States. They do so in a number of different ways, from critical viewpoints of the effects of racialization of humans as a tool for domination, through to building forms of resistance and empowerment across borders. Sonia Gomez's sculptures are acts of coming together, constructing using only materials that have been handed to her by others, taking on errant leftovers and combining them to create sites of intense encounter and entanglement. Gomez's transformation of disowned and unwanted materials give them a new significance and life. The sculptures metaphorically bear the memories of the materials, original owners, and every material is imbued with latency of life. Javiera Simons, extensively researched into colonial history, informs the work in her Sound Down series, which juxtaposes black and white historical imagery with floral backdrops and patterns of contemporary life in the USA. Her index series focuses on the body as a single subject, revealing cultural artifacts beneath lifted skirts. The work plays with juxtapositions of inside and outside body and image, individual and society, self and the other. All these works situated contemporary narratives within the layer and entangled history of the US experience. This work by Invernomuto and Jim Sinet is based on Colombia Pico music culture from the northern region of Colombia. The new immersed installation centers specifically on the village of Palenque, which was the first free Africa town in the Americas established in the 17th century. <laughs> The piece considers music as a form of knowledge, while tracing the history of Picasso as a point of contact between West Africa and South America. 
during this transatlantic slave trade. Concerned with how our bodies register experience, the editing patterns of the film reflect some patterns of hair braiding, which were developed by slaves to transmit secret messages as a tool of resistance. Thank you for joining us. If you want more information, we are doing curatorial tours every Thursday. You can also access through our website, liverpoolbiennial2021.com. More information about exhibition trails, tickets, and more online content. Thank you, Chris. Um, so these are the videos that we did for each of the venues. Like I said, um, I'm going to share now uh, my uh, screen and give you just a walkthrough. So as you could see in the, in the video, many of the concerns that I came, let's say from Latin America to Liverpool were, you know, it was a very important site because somehow it was a, an investigation, I would say, of the different ways that, um, you know, the Eurocentric form of understanding the world and uh, understanding the body has um, created certain um, binaries and bifurc bifurcations uh, in, our, in the reading of our world. So somehow many of the artists were looking from different perspectives, how inside and outside, uh, you know, it's like kind of a fluxus. That's why the stomach is a very important, that's why the stomach is part of the title, you know, like the stomach at the site of transmission and connection, and uh, as well as a port as a site of transmission and connection. So uh, what I tried to do with the biennial was creating through the practices of others, you know, like through, let's say, the provocation of thinking what a body might be and what a port has and what the port of Liverpool has to do with the definition of a body today, uh, was through the research and the commissions. We had like 27 or 28 new commissions uh, among the artists that we invited, thinking about the fluidity of bodies, the transformation, the kind of uh, for me, it's very important to think like a body as like is constantly, you know, eating the outside and transforming both itself and the and the environment where where it is, and in and in other ways as well, you know, like if we are like, you know, one of the artists that we invited, for instance, was very much uh, looking into food and, and, and how our stomachs are the, the place where our landscape is, is being formed. Uh, there were other artists who were looking much more about this um, fluidity, like compositions. For instance, in Lewis, um, Lewis, uh, Lewis, this is, Lewis is in Spanish, badly pronounced, Lewis building. <laughs> Lewis building, which was like one of our main venues in the Biennial, is an old, was an old department store that uh, that kind of is one of these historical places that have been closed for, for many, many, many years. And we were lucky enough to be able to actually host uh, like 17 artists there, which would also allow us to close many of the venues that we were planning at the beginning to show work. Uh, and in that sense, for instance, Reto Pulfer were like originally was going to do a collaboration with Camille Hendrod. And at the end, you know, we had to deconstruct that process into doing some, something completely different. The Louis department store had three floors and the third floor, each of the floors were quite different. In the third floor, it was, you know, like, uh, like uh, all like a fitted place that eventually would offices will, will arrive. But with, with the arrival of COVID, all this project um, kind of delayed so we were able to occupy these spaces and um not only here within all 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 of the spaces that i that i uh, you know like um work with uh, even the tate as well as open eye uh, open eye and the blue coat i didn't build any additional infrastructure uh, any additional walls i kept every space as it was and somehow trying to create the temperature the texture of every exhibition with what i already was given to me you know so kind of that was the context so it was a lot of work to see how you know 
to create an exhibition with what is given. So for instance, here you have Reto Pulfer who works very much with ideas of transformation and alchemy. And through these textiles, they are like kind of, you know, they are nothing and everything. And they are kind of paintings that go through the space. I was able, for instance, to the third floor to articulate the whole exhibition about ideas of uh, transmission, ideas of transformation from a perspective uh, like, more literally the transformation, like a kind of a spiritual transformation with the work of Sora Bhura, who his work, The Coast, which is um, uh, quite remarkable uh, group of uh, images, as well as um, two videos. We had two videos of this, of this work. One is on the left that you can see, and another one is where the windows are. And uh, recalls a moment in somewhere in India, it doesn't say specifically where, like a kind of a borderline, psychological borderline, where people go to clean scene with the sea and create an anew. So in a way, this idea of rituality, an idea of transformation uh, in that sense, to more this idea like the liquid, liquid is very much as well, very present in the, in the whole biennial from this ocean to the liquids that go through our body and how actually we are bodies of water at the same time. So from sort of Hura, you walk through these kind of textiles that Reto had produced to Luo Junior Shin, who uh, is presenting um, a whole sort of system around uh, spaces of transmission and contamination that for him are the toilets and has to do with some sort of like a queer life where the toilets happens a lot of things and where actually he's taking the idea of urine as something productive and a places of you know not only of transmission in terms of body liquids but also transmissions between the earth and us you know like something that comes and circulates between us and the land um, to more like scientific, like Anne Graffe, who does works uh, very much in how um, uh, things, um, uh, how our stomach and our microbio like microbiotica, like our stomach actually defines our mental health. So in a way, everything that we consume or everything that we put in our skin, in, you know, it's not, it's not a frontier of our skin, but it's of course something porous. So it transforms us and it's in a way is registered by our stomach and it's not the, the brain that reads the world, but actually is the stomach who determines the way that you can read the world. And in a way, this is something that is present through the biennial as well, like how actually we read the world, not only cerebral, but we read the world through different senses. Like it will be auditory, like the sound as a form of knowledge, or it like can be the stomach, uh, you know, through food, or it can be the skin through, through makeups. Um, again, like with this desire to kind of take these ideas of music to a place of, you know, it's always, you know, like the idea of the academic, the scientific, the intellectualities that, you know, the West have legitimized with other intellectualities that are not legitimized and how to bend them together. Eric Beltran um, uh, did a project which, which was um, a combination how actually cumbia music, that cumbia music, maybe you, some of you are familiar or not, is a, a music from Latin America, uh, born in, you know, in, it has is like an Afro intellectuality in many ways, but let's say it was, it's it's from Colombia uh, roughly, and uh, he makes a whole reading of the cumbia through a um, quantum physics um, perspective. So he worked with a quantum physics. Um, professor and in a way the idea of dancing cumbia and in a, in a way the way that dan the, the, the cumbia is described the sounds that it brings is really much to take you to a physical experience that is closer to the quantum physics that rather than any you know like the most uh, sort of um, idea of the tropical that is actually many times related tropical and fun and and a little bit superfluous that is related to this type of trop tropical music in, 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 in the world that actually take it to completely a different place. Um, so, um, so these are like, for instance, all this, all the, uh, like uh, you had it in like a taxi. This is a project, for instance, that we had to uh, body fight as well because of the biennial. So these are like a mural that he did in relation to this, uh, sort of syncrety between the quantum physics and cumbia, but also we had this, um, 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 I said QR codes that were in taxis 
all over the city of Liverpool. And certain number of taxis actually had the cumbia music that you could have the full experience of listening to cumbia music and his podcast around Liverpool city. Um, and uh, again, with these ideas as well to create these, you know, uh, making closer these ideas of, you know, like um, the desire to one, think about oceans as, as an as a as a form of creating its own our own identity like how you know identity is much more fluid and fluxus and contaminated and and porous to the environment and not so 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 binary let's say in many ways as well angel uh, alberta Wito presented uh, whispers and a cry between a whispers and a cry a beautiful video divided in months where she talks about all these experience from being from barbados and identifying her identity through the sea um, and Lamin Fofana, who is an artist from Sierra Leone, living here in Berlin, in another floor, which was it is completely the entire floor, we had two artists, Lamin and Sineb Sedira. And Lamin did the work that it was um, a uh, uh, a kind of a translation to the word, the book song. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a it's a book where relate we talks about uh, the. Uh, tragical uh, act of a boat uh, with um, enslaved uh, people and were coming out from Liverpool that were thrown out of the sea because the insurance cost more than actually the life of this of this of this enslaved. And uh, he did that incredible sound work, which it occupied the entire floor about um, not I wouldn't say about the kind of a translation of what this kind of moment of like a deep water of between science fiction and um, and uh, and a reflection of um, what you know like a reflection of what is to be human and this you know humanity is what we are looking for. So it was very charge uh, sound work and the next to it was Sineb Sedira with um, a series of photographs from uh, actually Montpellier where is all the sugar from different places are hold in one warehouse and then you know like you cannot see here very clearly but you can see that the sugar has different colors so depending from the geopolitics that the geography that they come they arrive and then eventually they make it white and sugar, of course, is very important as well in relation to the history of, of colonization for the forced enslavement um, and other um, things. But as well, in Liverpool, and this work had to do with one of the collections in Liverpool that at the end we, did, we couldn't show, has the oldest collection of false teeth in, in England and the biggest collections of false teeth. So actually, this history of sugar, uh, uh, um, Sugar uh, I exchange. Sorry, my English is not so good today. And um, it has to do with uh, the development of false teeth because the more sugar was imported to England, the more sugar was placed in anything that you would eat, and the more rotten teeth you would have. So therefore, you had to create something that will substitute the teeth that were falling because you were eating sugar. So in a way, it's like somehow what I'm interested as well is in these ideas of, you know, like colonization doesn't only happen somewhere else, you know, is this idea that it happened elsewhere. Actually, our bodies are constantly transformed those, for those, you know, because of those processes, historical processes that are undergoing until today. Um, then we had, Rusty Johnson was a, one of our public sculpture, which was in the, you know, outside in the piers uh, where all these boats with uh, many goods, as, but as well with, uh, you know, boats that will carry humans and, and traffic with humans between Africa and the America went out from there as well. And he did one of his um, series from Stack stacked heads um, and it's very much kind of talking about this collective trauma in a kind of being hysterical like you know in a in a position of you know of almost like um, in a position of almost collective position of uh, being okay like kind of surviving but at the same time carrying with you all that history on all that load within your own bodies 
And Ines Dujak and John Baker, for instance, talking about ideas of transmission. And uh, this is like a work that it was supposed to be like a parade that would have happened the day of the opening, talking about the history of pandemics. And actually we had to not uh, do this, 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 um, this parade, we couldn't do it anymore. And in a series of podcasts, these are like things that we are transforming. I put it in here as well, because they will have to go through transformations because we couldn't do them anymore. In a series of podcasts, talking uh, really about the, the history of, of, the, of, of transmissions and pandemics uh, the last 500 years, which are quite incredible if you have a chance to see there in the website. And um, we also, for instance, had it like at the Tate, we had the work of them where in the Tate, for instance, talking about how to, the, the biennial, the, the um, Liverpool Biennials is very specific because you actually have relationship with different institutions and each institution has a very different nature. So the Tate is very, very different to Open Eye and it's very, very different to Blue Code. They have completely different, you know, uh, forms of working, publics, and missions. So somehow um, my work as well was to actually kind of use that as a potential. And, and in the case of the Tate, you know, they have a great collection. And um, so I, I amplified that as part of, of the exhibition. And I saw one of the works as well from Ines, Ines Dujak and John Baker on the history, Master Voices is the history as well of textiles and music is a very elaborated work together with Martin Sims, who is uh, the borrowed lady that also talks about gestures and sounds and, and, um, and, and kind of looking at feminists from a race perspective as well. And this work, for instance, was from the collection of the Tate. So in a way I was trying to, in each case, in each venue somehow see what are the potentials in order to somehow respond as well to the space where I was you know, exhibiting. Mrs. Camille wrote in the last, uh, in the lower floor of the Lewises, where, for instance, as feminism and the subordination of the woman's in, in the body, it's present in the whole, in the whole biennial. Uh, Camille Henrot did an incredible new body of works around ideas of motherhood. And, and in this sense was like, us, well, the liquid here was present, but much more in, in the tone of red, like this idea of the liquid as menstruation, but also the liquid as the, you know, breastfeed and the breastfeed as a connection between the, uh, the breast, like the milk being food as a connection between one and the mother and all the sort of, um, consequences that has that into the woman body in the reproduction rights, but also in the way that a woman is defined within a Western form of understanding the body. Um, so, and to end, I would say Linder. Linder, for instance, was one of the artists that did as well, like, uh, and then we can talk uh, um, some. Uh, a little bit about our experience, but Linda uh, is a Liverpoolian artist. She's a very important artist as well, uh, sort of in the feminist uh, um, arm of, of, of um, British art, I would say. And with her, what we did is we created this incredibly big collage uh, in one of the uh, sort of shopping district areas because she's very interested in the idea of consumism and how the body of the woman somehow is being portrayed in the mass media and she's interested in porn as well and she's interested in kind of this idea of the erotism of the woman's body and how it has been sort of uh, uh, exploited in a particular way since the 70s till today. And she did like a, this special mural for us, you know, like and then she included the stomach as well. So it was quite, quite quite uh, a fantastic uh, uh, piece of work. And, and then with that, we did like some performances in a very small scale because otherwise we couldn't do it. And I think with, I hope I gave you like some, you know, it's, it's many years of work. <laughs> in three years of work in, I don't know, 50 minutes. So I hope I give you like a little bit of a taste of the work that we did, but maybe we can actually have a conversation with Sam or, or, or Christian if you want to give us uh, some questions uh, we are, we've, or the, the, the people who are interested in our conversation also participate in a conversation, we will be very happy. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Manuela, for running us through three years of work in uh, the <laughs> uh, 
just over 25 minutes. So yeah. I think that was, that was a brilliant achievement in, in itself. And uh, uh, I want to, before opening it up to everyone, I would like to go back to uh, the timeline of the project, maybe. And um, because I think uh, having had also the opportunity of, of talking with you, Manuela, just before the pandemic hits and remembering how everything was literally almost ready to be installed. And, and, and uh, it was a couple of months before the, the opening would happen. Uh, I would like to go back to that moment and, and try to understand, um, maybe not to that moment, but the following months, let's say, and uh, try to understand how you, how you approached the, the change that was looming and that was obviously going to affect the project, both in terms of uh, how you related to the artists, but also, of course, with how you navigated also very practical questions in terms of um, how do you go about replanning something like that two months before and, and um, the uncertainty that was bound to the first months of the pandemic? I, I think if we all go back to that moment, we had no idea what was going to be, not to come, not to develop. We had no idea. Like I remember we had to do the press release. We were planning to do the press release, you know, like a, you know something in London and something, you know, they did, usually did like a very sort of, important event in London launching the Liverpool Biennial. And we were about, you know, like determining the place, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I knew, and then I arrived and it was like, um, my, my boyfriend had friends in China and actually Beijing was already closed. And he told me, I don't want you to be stressed out, but I don't think your biennial is going to happen this year. I don't think, you know, I think, and I was like, of course no, don't give me bad vibes, blah, blah, blah. But, but then since, but then very quickly we knew that things were closing and you know it was quite fast i would say there's this process of not knowing to actually it's you know lockdown and for it we had like one of the artists luisa ungar who did like a, she's for instance one of the person who had to change radically her work she worked only with performances and eventually we did a series of phone calls with her like one on one phone calls throughout the biennial that was like you know, with her was like an incredible, uh, like effort, collective effort to understand how her practice can happen in a pandemic time. So I think, uh, which I will go back to this, but I think for instance, she was there researching and, and we had to buy her a ticket because she couldn't, you know, she couldn't change the other ticket because the, you know, everything was crazy. So I think at the beginning was just like, everybody should go home and be feel safe. That was like my first reaction, is everyone okay? Like, it's, it's like, we don't know, like, this is crazy, but it's, you know, with Luisa was like, okay, we buy you tomorrow, go tomorrow, go, go, go now, you know, like we have no idea. So it was more like about feeling secure. The second thing, it was like, already I remember that people were thinking, okay, so we postponed it for a couple of months and we're like, but we don't know. Let's try to actually, my uh, emphasis was like, let's see what artists are in the moment. We should pay all the artists their fees because probably, you know, I didn't know if the biennial would even happen, you know? So let's pay the fees to the artists because they already counted with that support for this year and they already did the work, you know? So let's just give that sort of, sort of support structure that we can do that. And then, and then just, you know, not, let's not talk about the biennial for, for as, 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 as we, as until we know what we can do more or less, which was, also like a couple of months afterwards, which indeed we didn't know anyway. And, um, but by then I have to say that I had a very good producer, very good producer as somebody from, you know, from the team. And we started to engage certain artists needed conversation and certain artists didn't want conversation at all. So it was kind of measuring like who wanted to have a conversation and who wanted to develop because they, you know, Ebony Patterson, an artist who was doing something is like, instead, that was crazy. And we, and we went for it some, and it was like, instead of like every artist was going as small in her work, it started to grow and she lived in, 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 um, Chicago, you know, and this is transport cost, yeah? And her work was growing and growing and growing. We were like, oh my God, this is like not going financially for us to a good place. But what can you do, you know, is in a moment of 
Whereas other ones were like, I think we want to reduce. You know, it was really strange depending the place where they came from, but everyone had to, had not only us, but everyone had to, many of the artists had to have a reconsideration of their own practices. And I think in that sense, this kind of eager to be able to finalize something that it was almost there, you could see in the work of the artist that somehow everyone was like, okay, we go for it. This is what we can do. And, and again, I had a very good team that, you know, in, the, in that sense, could actually support that process and and uh, yeah, in in an organization that supported that, which I think it was key for me. But it was not out of drama. <laughs> but you know, I can guarantee you. <laughs> but it was, but it was intense. It was intense, and it was like as well many many sensations of mourning. Like I had to let it go many things from the biennial, and for the first thing, I think that what is very hard is that we as curators or artists, we work for the future. So, and for me, I walked, you know, like I walked through the biennial before these changes many, many times in my head. So I had to let it go. I, it was really, really sad that I had to let it go this because we work like this, you know, and then we imagine how the space will be and we walk through the space in our heads. And then of course we change things when we arrive, but we do this process of imagining, reimagining. So kind of not letting go many times, it was kind of painful, I would say, as a curator, I would say. Sam, did you want to add something or? Um, I think because I came on so late, I wasn't involved in those initial negotiations at all, or all that work or reconfiguring or the discussions with the artists. But of course, even when I came, they kept on happening. So. It's um, even coming quite late to the to the stage that there were things changed constantly and they changed again and they changed because of the kind of political situation or because of regulation or because mm -hmm. artists needed things to shift and the team just flexed each time. I guess the thing that helped me was that I having done this, I kind of been working in the institution. So I'd reopened, I closed, I reopened, I closed already. So this pattern for me felt like, oh, I know we can do this. We can do this. We just need to keep working together. Um, so, and the amazing thing about coming to the biennial was it has this, had this energy, this kind of speed and this energy and this, um, it was really clear to me that it was going to happen. You know, this kind of biennial, bringing everybody together, there's this one moment, it's not contingent upon, you know, um, a program for us as a biennial that's set and has something before and has something after, it's, it's, this is everything. And, and that was really um, amazing to be part of and to help deliver. Um, and I, yeah, and I think the tricky thing was obviously the way the biennial works is it works with lots of organizations that don't have that flexibility. You have Tate and you have open, you know, you have all these galleries who also, who do have a program afterwards and they do have a program before. So the kind of built-in flexibility that a biennial has isn't felt throughout all the partners and they needed to really kind of be constantly shifting when it had really significant impacts for them. Um, so that was, yeah, that was definitely a challenge. I can imagine the yeah scheduling negotiation and all of that. So yeah, um, be, I mean, I'm. First of all, I wanted to ask everyone if you if you want, you're more than happy to turn on your cameras now uh, so we can see you and it feels more like a collective uh, moment uh, while waiting for uh, questions, which we're more than happy to receive either through the chat or if you raise your hands through the reaction button. Uh, I wanted to go back to the to the show um, and uh, and ask you because I think it's it's a theme that is so closely related with uh, so this idea of of questioning the body of questioning um, 
our way of exchanging between the body and the world and, and so on. I was wondering, and I think it's, I think the, the, the work that you described before uh, of uh, uh, Ines, Ines Dujac and, uh, and John Baker is, is quite striking in that sense that, that it, it actually was investigating something uh, that we would all face even though we didn't know it probably when you when you planned to show mm -hmm. uh, so i was wondering in the in the months that followed that the, the first lockdown and so on um you talked about how much the work have changed and how much some of the work had to change because of the limitations and so on but i'm wondering from from your perspective um i don't know what kind of room you had at the time but could you also adapt a little bit the the, the general scheme and the general framework of it to the to the pandemic or was it influenced or no not really because okay. you know like it was more because i didn't invite it you know like i the idea that we had to change it didn't matter so much to me because i invited the artists because of their practices rather than specific objects i was interested in the practice of ines i was interested in the practice of camille i was interested in the practice of luo junior shane so in a way, I think that was like the, that was like the less painful <laughs> because, you know, it was like, OK, let's talk with the artists and we will resolve it. You know, like, OK, we have it was much more like, OK, like Diego Bianchi. It's a person is an artist from Argentina. He needs like three weeks with you in the space in order to do their things, you know. So it was much more like Diego. I don't think you will be able to come. How do we do this? you know and then the work completely changed to what we had planned to do but it was anyway his practice and as well i think in that sense the biennial as a as a place for production was really good because we in that sense we were flexible to be able to work with the artists and kind of go very deep in the idea of what a commission can be you know like what entails to do a commission that is not only a facilitator but it's like an interlocu interlocution you know like really understanding the practice of the other and looking for solutions within the conditions that we have and and in that sense i think to me it was much more about that and actually for me even i wouldn't have called it you know i resisted a lot that we called it like themes for me like the biennial was an opportunity to actually inquire you know and like kind of question and created a framework for artistic practices to you know to kind of like more thinking in permaculture to be together and relate to each other so so the, and then they were like i think i mean that we have a pandemic and we had the you know like the black life matters movement it's not something that happened you know suddenly this is like things that have been already you know for years being uh, and, and they are they you know they they come out and sometimes they retract and they, you know they are like organisms and themselves all these movements or situations like a pandemic so i think this is something that already many artists were concerned like jenna sutella or ines ideas of transmission and pandemics and how pandemics are being told for instance for ines was like how are like the narratives around it it has to do with ideas, although they didn't, da, da, da. you know, it, it, you know, it was, it, it had to do with what was happening, but because I think there were practices already kind of not saying that, not, not like, not like, it's like, uh, how you say, fortune, fortune tellers, no, but more like readers of the today, you know, so I think in that sense, also, that's why I, I think the biennial is very rich in that sense as a format, because it can actually really be very precise of what is you know what is the productions of today is doing to the works in certain places and giving a framework no you give a framework in order to you know because otherwise the selection can go forever you know the biennial you know can have 50 100 you know team biennials with 200 artists you know but but it's not you know like what i'm saying is like you know that's our work to kind of creating some sort of um concise uh, experience if you like and 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 I think in that sense it was it had to do with the, the times because there were things that were like already in in, in there and mm -hmm. and very much present we still are I think so for sure yes um I have another question <laughs> since we're still open and we're not pressed too much by the rest of the audience really. 
uh, which is the very rich and and really I have to congratulate for the online content that you provided. And I hadn't have I had, didn't have the chance of coming to Liverpool, of course. Um, and nevertheless, I have the feeling that yes, I didn't have the experience with the works physically, which is something that I think we've all missed a lot in these last two years. But in terms of understanding the concept, understanding the reasoning, understanding some of the works um, premises and, and why they were chosen, why they were made in a certain way. I think it's, uh, uh, it's a brilliant example of what can be transmitted uh, online. Um, and I was wondering, was that something, I mean, I imagine that of course it was accelerated by the fact that, that not a lot of people could come um but what was the what was the process behind deciding what to put online how to put it online i found the videos uh, of you describing each venue individually and even each floor within the venue amazing because it was literally like <laughs> following you on a, on a, on a curatorial tour uh, <laughs> even though i imagine that it was quite a lot of work <laughs> yeah it was it was kind of crazy, but I think that is, for instance, when Sam arrived, and I know there was like a lot of pressure for everybody, every organization to become online. It was like a lot of pressure, you know, like to have things online. Like it was like, okay, now we have to invent, you know, like anything that we have to do. But again, I don't, I, you know, like the, it's like the online, it, it has a diff, different conditions. If I would have done like a Bahian online, it would have been completely different, but you know. So that's, for instance, when Sam arrived and I was like, Sam, I don't want to do a, like a, a biennial. I mean, like, I, and, and Sam was like, because she has this, you know, she also comes from exhibition making. She, at least we were like, I think it was like, phew, you know, she agrees like, no, we don't have to do that. And it was like, really, no, I was really thinking like how we could try to, and we did, we were not even going to do like an online version at all. It was something that we were realized, no, Sam, that we're saying like, maybe we have to do something. How do we do this? And, uh, and it was like kind of keeping it as simple as possible. We didn't, we didn't actually arrive to have, it would have been amazing to arrive to all the content at the beginning of the biennial. But for instance, that was not possible. We'd really try, no? <laughs> but it was not possible because we didn't have so much time. But to do it, it was like three months really, no? You arrived in December and I was, yeah, we were like, three months. right? And yeah. we were like, uh, how, it was that, on my how list. Much can we do? Yes. Yeah. So when I arrived, there were one of the things on my list was what about the digital? There's this channel. Maybe we don't know what it is. We don't know what's going to be on it. We don't have any money for it, quite frankly. Um, was another we've got no one to create the content. Um, and then I think what was clear to me was what Manuel has been describing, which was that this wasn't a biennial. This wasn't the biennial hadn't. It wasn't a digital program. It was it was a biennial that being created to bring these works and these conversations and these artists together, um, and so it, it wasn't a way of it was a way of kind of transmitting those ideas without um, saying this is a you know this is a, a kind of um, we use the term portal and I think that was quite deliberate because it was a way to access the biennial it wasn't the biennial so it wasn't a, a stand in for it it was a way to engage just what you described at the beginning Christian engage with those ideas and perhaps to give you a way of negotiating and making connections between them um yeah and we, and we got some additional funding to support some of that content as well from the government so the cultural yes. recovery fund which I'm sort of I'm obliged to say that like but it's it's true we're incredibly grateful for that additional money yes but, but it was interesting, like I saw like, for instance, like for the videos, like I knew that I wanted to do videos, like I really knew because I thought it's the only way that I can actually show the relationship with works, between works that for me is very important that one person, you know, like I worked, I mean, for me, the exhibition as a, as a format for me is very important in my practice. And I, we saw, we saw many and we're like, okay, how do we want to do it? How short we want to do it? And, and then it was, yeah, and then it was, just a matter of, um, I think the whole sort of rule for me was like, how we, what do we have and what is possible? Like, you know, we cannot, you know, this idea of the biennial thinking impossible, no way. It was like, what is possible, you know? 
Uh, but I think somebody had, uh, Aki, I think you yes, had, Aki, your... you had uh, raised hands. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I... Uh, hi. Hi. Aki from Yokohama, Japan. Congratulations for opening your uh, biennial. We also opened our triennial during the pandemic. Um, and you partly asked, actually answered my question already about uh, that balance between the digital and the, you know, the physical and how you shifted because my issue really was how to balance out um, the digital and physical in a way that, as you said, we didn't have an additional physical, uh, additional funding for digital, as well as we didn't, you know, our team did not have that um, team skill, like, you know, that was additional resources that we had to find. So I was just wondering how you try to balance that, but I think you answered that. But in addition to that, my question also goes to understanding how you shifted your um, focus on the audience, perhaps. I think we, we our, our Japanese um, biennials, our uh, audience physically is usually Japanese because we're, we're I guess you're on an island, we're on an island. So, you know, I mean, we, we do focus on our local audience a lot, but also the international and the digital was very important for our international audience. And so we had to converse in the international audience through our digital, but, you know, that was a lot of burden for us um, because that was the only channel to go overseas. So Thank did you, you, how did you balance out your audience focus or, you know, perceive how your audience response may be or how were they at, at the end? I think Sam, I will let you answer because this is also conversations we had to Sam and I was like, who are, who is going to come? You know, like all this effort, who is going to come? It was like, for me, a tragedy, you know, because I don't do it for myself. You know, it's like you do it, you know, and especially in an enterprise this, this size, you know, like, uh, but I think that's why, I mean, some answer a little bit, but for instance, the digital, what I was, I, I think what I tried for instance, like the videos that you saw was one thing that it was more about the exhibition. Then the other thing that uh, we did, it was like this curatorial tours online. And I would say that it was, and I invited people because it was, I was the only curator. So I invited every Thursday, uh, people who had converse with like talk with me through the biennium to have a conversation about some specific work or because as well it's like a biennial is very big so how do you do it in, like what happens now in an hour and you know like you know so the experience of a show is always fragmented it's never total you know so so then suddenly in the in the vi virtual world you want to be total like I have to show every aspect of it you know like you have this kind of anxiety almost and, and the experience in life experiences, not like this. So I think to me it was like that. And the third thing I did, which, you know, they, they, they even made fun a little bit my, my colleagues because I became like this Instagram person who I talked with everybody through Instagram, you know, I was like, and it was like the, that was more for the artists. So I did a lot of Instagram talks only to have the presence of the artist because in a way what had happened with the organization is that we were like kind of in spiritual sessions that you had to think for the artist, man for the artist, you know what I mean? Like they were not there. So you had to compensate among the team to do that part of the job. So how, and I miss them terribly, you know, I personally, you know, and then, you know, these Insta talks were like kind of the way to have them somehow for them psychologically also to feel they participated in the biennial. Um, so, and to me, they became almost like an audience. It's really weird to think like that, but almost like that. Uh, uh, but yeah, like I think audiences, it was something that to me was always a concern. And I think in that sense, Sam was always, you know, like I had worked for three years and, you know, I was going crazy, <laughs> but Sam had, you know, came like much more like, you know, it's going to open. People are going to come, you know, like it was much more like this, you know, and I think it is true. It became a very important, you know, Sam was saying at the beginning, an important aspect of, you know, building up trust to go out, which that it was not, you know, uh, that it was a cultural thing to do that you could do, no, Sam, I think maybe. Yeah, I, I think so. There was something about that. And I also wanted just to mention that you talked a little bit about loss at the beginning, like a loss and then a loss and losing the audience, losing who we thought would come was a loss. And that was much harder for everybody in the team because 
they they'd lived with that so that what you know kind of Manuela described this kind of almost this kind of psychical projection of of how she'd and all these losses and my losses weren't so intimate because I came in at this stage so there was a much more pragmatic response which is just we are we are going to do this and we will have audiences and if it doesn't open then we'll open it then and we will market it to local audiences and spend our money here and we will you know i think the digital what manny was just manuela was describing about the digital is interesting because there's despite what we were saying earlier there's this kind of compensatory um aspect of it as well so how do we make sure that each artist is represented um in a dialogue as well as through a video it's not you know it's not the same how do we try and make those connections or, you know, the thing that we couldn't do is we brought the artworks together, but we couldn't bring the people internationally together in the same way. Um, and now, of course, we know really clearly what our, you know, what our audiences were, and they were local and national. A large majority of them were national, so not as I expected it to be more locally balanced, but more national. And we had just 2% international which I am delighted with, you know, you couldn't even get to the, you know, it took so much effort to get to the UK, that that 2% um, is, I'm just delighted with. And like you, you know, the digital audience, international audience grew phenomenally. And that was the way that we connected the ideas, curators, you know, Manuela did a program, a kind of program where she brought young curators together to discuss ideas with thinkers around the biennial. Um, and that was another way of trying to um, have those conversations that we would normally have in person online as well. So all those things sort of came together. Um, and someone asked about funders as well. Um, and the funders, like yeah, the funders were really supportive. So um, despite the fact obviously we have far reduced visitor figures that the artist perhaps didn't get you know the exposure that was part of every single funder I mean the team here um, spoke with all the funders and updated them about what was happening and suggested ways of of doing the things that um, had been committed to but all those funders came through but of course what they they came through with the money that was committed to the biennial but of course um, the biennial cycle, the way it works is it, you know, delaying it for a year means you've incurred another year of costs that aren't budgeted for. Um, it's not like an institution. It's not, you're not making savings. You're just, your expenditure is growing exponentially. Um, so that was really, you know, as it was, is being for everybody in the biennial field, like incredibly difficult. Um, and again, we did manage to secure additional funding from the government to support those costs. Um, so which was which happened after I came on board. So that happened really quickly. Um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I think that described uh, all the difficulties on, on an institutional level, let's say, of of facing it. I think we just uh, scraped the surface of all difficulties, <laughs> to, be honest, to be honest, like, oh my goodness. No, yeah. it was such an intense experience and... Um, yeah. It yeah. was very, very funny. Like it was like, you know, I had to change venues many times. And I think the, the by the third time, you know, like if in a not, let's say we would have happened in the first, but without pandemic, one time it would have been like such a huge crisis. Yeah, like I would have, you know, like collapsed. <laughs> and, and in this way, I was like, okay, we had to change. Okay, how do we do it? You know, it was like much more like, okay, it doesn't, you know, this is like nothing, you know, like we can do this. So, in, you know, it was like kind of interesting to see how crisis even plays when, you know, within our own sort of work culture as well, you know, like, uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting that, you know, like uh, how we received, let's say, the bad news, you know uh previously and now now i think we are like uh a little bit more have more room for buttons i guess <laughs> yeah or they are not as bad yeah well i want to use the last occasion to ask everyone in the audience if they have extra questions for sam and, and manuela 
if that's not the case, I would like to really thank you both a lot for, for your time, uh, for the effort, for all the content that you provided online to us and everybody else. And um, yeah, wishing you a great uh, 2023 biennial in Liverpool, hoping to be able to experience it live. And uh, yeah, to all your project Manuela as well, <laughs> future projects. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I'll uh, think we can. Thank you, thank you everybody for yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the invitation and for the interest. How in June you. 23. June 23. Yeah, yeah, 23. Everybody. I will be there. See I you will in be Liverpool. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. I just want to say thank you, Christian. I know they're still, they can hear us say thank you. We're, we're still right. live. I was, I was, yeah, trying to catch uh, Jennifer.